Okay, I'm starting the live stream with the discus thing, even though we would rather people be here. <laughs> Hi, Kendall. Hey, Arkady, how are you? Doing good. Uh, I tried to start it, uh, you know, like other sessions and yeah. showed me the failure, so I jumped here. It's interesting because it, it says failure like in the the web client pop up, but then yep. it'll say that it's actually streaming in the Zoom client. And then if you go and check in like summit.opendev or whatever, you like can actually see the stream. So like, I don't know why it keeps saying it's failing because I've definitely had that too, but it's like ended up streaming anyway. Okay, I can go try. Well, to no, we, we want you to be here anyhow, Arkady. Exactly. All right, all right. <laughs> Happy to. Yeah. How are you doing, Aran? It was a long time. It is. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm super excited about this opening for labs. It's 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 really uh, kind of where we wanted to be. Yeah, I remember discussing it with you like. I don't know, almost three years ago. Yep. When it was uh, you know infrastructure as a service or you know cloud as a service uh, offering, as well as the security and the uh, you know bare metal configuration to go along with it. When do you, is is it, do you think it's Screen, screaming at this point? Oh, it is, good. Okay. Yep, it should be. Okay. Um, I'm gonna hit record if I'm a host, just so that we get a, a, a copy of any chat comments later. Yeah, go for it. Cool. I think we're ready to go. We didn't prepare a particular specific presentation because we had done the 101 and the, the keynote. Um, but if folks are not familiar with Open Info Lab, we certainly can give you guys a sort of a high level um, overview. Um, Baran, you actually said something in an earlier, um, in an earlier um, discussion at Project Keras that I thought was really summarized well some of what we've been doing. And that was, um, that the existing cloud providers, they're already doing things that cross, that go across multiple open tech projects. And they can do that because they're running it all within their own space. And the goal here is to create a, a space like that for, for the open source cloud. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in some sense, by being prescriptive, we limit sort of options. On the other hand, we add more options because we, we can now optimize across the layers in a way you can't if you're assuming that it could be deployed in any arbitrary fashion. And, and that's kind of what Project Sirius is about is specifically on the compute and storage interfaces doing those, allowing those cross optimized layer optimizations. But I think it's much broader than that. So it's really the only people here is Arkady and me. I know there's, uh... Jacob, Chappelle. Oh, great. Oh, There's good. About 12 people, but I oh. think everybody is quiet except us. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Actually, a bunch of other folks, too. So, so um, maybe we should just ask people to at least raise their hands. Do you guys want kind of Michael to give an overview, quick overview again of what um, Open Info Labs is about? Yeah, I think that would be fair enough. My opinion. Okay, give me a second and I will hunt down my presentation and run through the first couple of slides for you. Just take also, I did link the, the Etherpad in the Zoom chat. If everybody wants to go ahead and put their names as like attendees in the Etherpad, that would be awesome. Oh, that's a great idea. It's going to take me a second to get it to share properly. Sure. 
share screen. Yeah, so one kind of question I had uh, after the presentation is trying to understand the, uh, the, the differences between having multiple uh, zones or multiple sites which zone per site is a different con configuration per zone versus the federated model proposed here. Um, I guess but, a quick, quick question to kind of maybe help drive that resolute that question and resolution of the question. Uh, if the presentation uh, states the original context in which all of this started. It, it does talk a little bit about where it started. Yeah. Okay, cool. Then that will probably do it. So. Okay. Um, so the original mass open, the, this all came out of work that started with the, the mass open cloud, um, which is a partnership between Boston University, Harvard, MIT, Northeastern, and UMass in one data center uh, that's in the western part of the state of Massachusetts, where uh, power and, and space is less expensive. Uh, and the goal, uh, the original goal that we had six, seven years ago when Iran first hatched the idea with, with Peter was to create a self-sustaining at scale public cloud based on an open cloud exchange model so that we can have a marketplace for industry partners as well as researchers and industry to innovate and expose innovation to real users. We're sort of driven by this pain point that um, increasingly we couldn't see the underlying data that you need to do cloud research. That was, I think, what, what was sort of an initial, an initial pain point that the researchers were feeling that led to this. Um, and Iran, jump in if I'm, if I'm slaughtering the history at all. Um, the uh, partners of the MOC specifically include the five research universities, um, the Mass Green High Performance Computing Center, um, Intel, Red Hat, Two Sigma, um, the US Air Force, IBM, and the OpenStack Foundation. Um, the folks who are involved in Open InfraLabs are, are, are a broader collection. I'm, and I don't know if I have that picture in this slide, but I'll get to it. Uh, we currently, it, it currently has hundreds of servers. Uh, there are hundreds of students who are taught using it annually. Uh, there's CICD for a, a couple of open source projects at the moment. Um, and we have been deeply involved with using OpenStack since the beginning. Or Oran has, has, has mentioned in some previous talks how he was asked to talk at, open, at an OpenStack meeting with a group of other people running clouds. And he, afterwards they started talking and, and that was when Oran realized that all of the folks who he was on the stage with were using a product he had helped create, which was, v, which was vCloud Director as opposed to running it in, in pure OpenStack. This was five or six years ago. Um, but, but one of the main pain points that we run into is it's really hard to run an open source cloud. And so when we started the MOC, and we didn't realize how hard it was going to be to actually stand up and run it on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and the reason for that is because there's no commonality. Um, so each project has its own method of, um, each project within OpenStack tracks the data differently and there's not a common flow between them. So for example, when we wanted to do billing or monitoring, we had to sort of create it from scratch. Um, and when you stand up an open source cloud, typically you're doing it on different hardware configurations, unique installation steps, different services. There isn't any commonality there either. And so what that means is there's no way to encapsulate best practices. Uh, there's no easy way to compare information between the clouds. Each of us solves the problems we encounter in a different way. And we typically end up doing it by ourselves. Um, it also means that for the open source developer of the software, they don't have any visibility into how their software is actually being deployed, how it's being operated, how it's being used. And so the community may be working on problems that the operators don't want. And when the operators come to the community for help, there's really no way to reproduce it or debug it. Um, and, and so that's a challenge as well. The, the public clouds in some ways have an easier way of, 
of, of dealing with it because they're prescriptive. Um, they solve their problems the same way. If you look at one rack in one data center, it's probably identical to the rack in another data center. Um, they have real visit visibility into what users are doing. They can evaluate their software with real usage. They can evolve things dynamically with CICD. And this, this thing that we came to realize was that we really believe that if open source clouds are going to be successful in the long run, that the community needs its own cloud. And so back in about 2018, we, we reached out to the OpenStack Foundation to explore this, thinking that they were gonna be really pissed off. But, but at, what actually happened was Mark and Jonathan were like, yes, finally, this is, this is what we recognize we need to do. And then we got together in real life. We had a great MVP. It was a, it was a fun meeting. It, it's hard to argue with it, avoid doom. That should be the MVP for every project we all work on. Um, then we had a pretty clear goal and it's, it's still around that original federation model. Uh, it's to create a federated large scale cloud starting with academia. We're gonna start with the MOC. We wanna create a highly prescriptive cloud in the box solution, deploy it at the MOC and then replicate it at multiple, at multiple academic institutions. And then we wanna federate that into a large scale cloud. Um, so that's sort of the high level. Um, we picked academia. We, we picked academia because um, it's it's a really good starting point. We felt like we needed to have success in one spot. Um, it requires massive scale. It in, increasingly is depending on rich cloud tools. Um, there's a history of collaboration and federation across institutions. Um, so, for example. The MOC itself is a collaboration of that type. The Mass Green High Performance Computing Center is actually a data center run by the same five group of the same five universities. Um, the New England Research Cloud is being created between Harvard and Boston University. Another example. There's just there's a there's a there's a, a lot of, of experience doing that. But there's another part that's kind of even more exciting to us, and that's thinking about what it would be like if every class that's using the cloud was being trained using an open cloud. And if the academic researchers could actually get access to all of the data that they needed to do their research. Um, and I'm gonna really quickly skip through some of the research that we've done because I don't wanna take too much more time. Um, but some examples are WorldMap, which is used by tens of thousands of users around the world. There's smart cities projects that combine information on multiple cities, cloud telemetry that identifies and studies problems in the cloud. These are all projects that have been going on at the MOC on, on the cloud itself. Um, but then there's, there's also the research into an open cloud and that's stuff like cloud federation, cloud security, cloud storage research, integration of data repositories, network research, monitoring cloud services, integrating FPGAs, elastic secure infrastructure, which is actually going on in a separate form right now uh, at the same time. And that last capability started out as a, as a thing that was going on in research at the MOC as a product called Hill and BMI. It's now being productized and integrated into Ironic. Um, and that's actually, um, going to be an interesting part because what it allows us to do, I'll quickly run through this, um, how the MOC enabled all this research is that you have access to the real cloud data. You've got access to the metadata of the cloud. You can engage via the MOC with industry partners in the open source community. Then NSF funded open cloud testbed, or we call it the OCT allowed us to create a new um, national testbed for this. We're integrating Cloud Lab with the MOC to enable reproducible cloud research. And this is the ESI part. We can move the, the infrastructure around between the NERC, the MOC, the open cloud testbed, so that as we have the requirements and the needs, um, ah, Jen just mentioned the ESI one's been moved. Cool. <laughs> um, that as, as we have, for example, paper deadlines, we can move hardware around to, to meet that. 
Um, so a quick um, summary. Actually, actually, Michael, it's sort of, that's, I think you skipped over the last maybe most uh -huh. important part that all this stuff that we're doing. So we move forward when in animation is that this, this ability to grab a whole bunch of hardware and do deterministic experiments and access the cloud telemetry and everything is actually going to be all available through to open source developers as well as right. cloud researchers. Um, yeah. Because a bunch of this infrastructure came from other sources. So right. this is something we're really excited for this community to engage with and try to kind of blur the boundary between, I guess, the research community that's using it for research and the open source community. Yes. That was, I, thank, thank you. I was burying the lead and I, and in fact, skipping over it. Um, so uh, essentially what, what we're, what we're trying to get to is, um, starting with the MOC, creating a prescriptive cloud in a box that bridges the gap between operating system development and operations. Um, we're going to deploy cloud in a box. We're going to gain real experience. Uh, and when it's ready, we're going to work with other institutions to replicate and federate it. And what we learn from academia and the other cloud operators, that's going to get reflected back up into open infra labs, back into the releases. And the goal is that with a common code base, we think that the institutions are not only going to be able to, to, to take, ex take advantage of the learning that goes on at each of the different institutions, um, and by turning that into actual code. So for example, if you learn that you should be monitoring something at day 100 and you're using the same monitoring infrastructure as other universities or other cloud operators, then it becomes much more, much simpler to move to a model where you can start to replicate that up into open infra labs, back out into the cloud in the box. When you do your next update to it, you sort of automatically get those reports. Um, also, one of the things that we think is going to happen is when we start having a really common code base between these different institutions, they're not only going to be able to federate, but they could also potentially share operational skills and staff. Um, that already so, sort of go, go on around. I just want to add one thing. So one of the in the actual full part of the keynote that Michael recorded, of which it was cut, <laughs> unfortunately for time, um, there was a presentation by. Um, Scott Yokel and Wayne Gilmore, uh, who are the heads of research IT at Harvard and BU. Um, and so they're, they're sort of leading the NERC effort, which is to create, is, is going to be the production arm of all this, at least in sort of the Northeast region, where, so now we're, we have sort of this team, just to give you a context for the scale that these people operate at. They have 300,000 cores of compute in the MGH ECC right now. Um, with over 50 petabytes of storage. So it's not quite, you know, the public cloud scale, but it's a lot larger scale than even most enterprises. And so they're going to be kind of operating a production arm. So things will kind of roll from the prescriptive offering we develop in the MOC, we kind of roll it out. The first one will be NERC, and we're going to have them working as facilitators with this broader community. So we're really hoping that this community, you know, our eventual goal is to have these operators being able to both work to take th to take academia and help them help them use the services here, but also to go back and give to the open source community feedback on how things are used, and this open source community to have access to the telemetry of a real cloud that's being operated at scale in this environment. Because frankly, I believe that while they have three hundred thousand cores of compute with these HPC environments, it's going to be even larger as as we start moving into this cloud environment because it's not just for a whole bunch of specific computational uses, but it, it addresses needs across the universities. The other thing that is not in this set of slides uh, that I wanted to draw attention to is there are already a couple of projects like Project Keras, like the Elastic Secure Infrastructure that are beginning to move their home over to um, the Open Infra Labs Git repository because they cross multiple projects and it starts to become, our, our goal is to create a, an environment where, where people who are dealing with those sorts of, of, of issues where you're crossing projects have a place to talk and work together and 
figure out ways to do it in a way that that is helpful and that I mean Julia has been wonderful at sort of making sure that we're doing things in a way that 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 make that is a positive and not and not her tearing her hair out and yelling at us <laughs> and and that's sort of the goal is to create a place where that can go on within within the existing structures that that exist so I feel like I might be speaking out, out of turn, but um, <laughs> I, I, I where some of the, some of I guess my my original understanding is that what helped spawn some of this re, the original research was this idea that hey I've got this data center that's basically a DR site that has no running hardware but I need to keep it running and why do I why don't I provide some of these resources to other people that could use them. I might have to reclaim it really fast <laughs> mm -hmm. kind of scenario. And I think that's part of where this whole model really has a major potential impact because that forces you to take that in a box mindset or that repeatable pattern mindset and have all the tooling and mechanics to be able to go, I need to be able to relinquish all this or it's being taken from me. Right. That, that's <laughs> Sorry, somebody else was speaking. I'm gonna mute. Yeah, I was. Uh, yeah, I kind of understood understood that model also that you would like to be able to uh, have the full description of the cloud and be able to uh, replicate it. Uh, you know, maybe on the same site or multiple site as needed. Uh, you know, the entire thing. Uh, and the hardest and trickiest part is uh, networking setup for the entire thing. Uh, no surprises there. Um, you know, that's uh, kind of understandable. It's a little bit different from what I understood the earlier work was uh, kind of the cloud uh, as a service where you kind of uh, creating, uh, for lack of a better name, private cloud out of the, you know, larger cloud carving out for individual, you know, institution, user, community, uh, and creating exactly the configuration and the setup they need uh, you know, and then kind of bringing it back into the larger pool when it's no longer needed or you need to reclaim it back from them and reconfigure it for, you know, whatever the next cloud would be, uh, you know, with uh, potentially scaling the resources, you know, from one cloud to another as needed. So at least from my perspective, you guys are both right and wrong. So you, you're right in the sense that, um, that, uh, that, um, yeah, a fundamental goal was to create highly elastic um, and, in fact, being able to stand up new, new environments rapidly. Part of this was because um, we ourselves, you know, have, because it's interactive, the MOC, a lot of the uses are really highly interacting with their, their resources. We have strong dineural patterns. We'd like to give up the resources to be used by other environments, and we'd be able to like to steal resources from these HPC clouds. Um, similar to the open cloud testbed is, um, is actually experiments then before publication, before OSDI or SOSP or ASP plus, um, you know, these cloud testbeds have massive demand, right? And they're pretty idle the rest of the time. So being able to, having everybody that works in the same community have exactly the same, uh, share a common silo of equipment is the worst idea I've ever heard of um, because it's impossible to get any resources when you actually need it. So. Um, and we've actually worked with the Air Force here that has all kinds of infrastructure that is highly underutilized, which is exactly like what you want, right? Um, you don't want the fire trucks in your area to be 100% used um, when you actually have a fire, even though we normally think of high utilization as a good sign. So there's lots of infrastructure that, for example, is there to deal with national emergencies where they'd like to be able to have other good uses of it when there is a national emergency, which is 99.999% of the time. Um, oh. So there's this elasticity, but there's also the very fact that the MOC is sort of taken off. We have like 10,000 users of people on top of this and we, other academic institutions want to, we, we now it's gotten to the point where there's production offering and we want to replicate it and federate it and we'd like to be able to reach out to you guys, to the open source community and say, hey, look, we had this failure. 
you know, but it's like so impossible for people to reproduce problems when they don't have access to the logs and all the information and everything. So we want to expose all this information. And in a sense, that's, that's where this has started is the idea that, you know, Michael was talking to um, Jonathan and Mark and sort of saying, hey, you know, we think we should be a cloud that you have full access to. Um, so for reproducibility and eventually we'd like it to get to the world where, you know, uh, there's a change to uh, component. Um, it goes through a CI, it gets rolled out into through a CD to some portion of the MOC and then federated out to NERC and then eventually to other clouds. I mean, that agility has been what's driven the public cloud so successful. And we'd really like to see that. We really think that that's really important for the open source community and it doesn't really have it today. Does that make sense? So again, this is sort of a bit of an elephant, but this is a real cloud. Um, we've had problems because every other cloud that we've talked to does things a slightly different way than us. Um, getting just a complete solution with show back to academic users with everything you need end to end to create cloud of box solution is part of the thing. And we wanna have the whole thing highly elastic and growing and shrinking on demand um, because in our environment, it's, it, it's critical to achieve high utilization. So in order to achieve the high utilization, uh, especially for the running workloads, uh, usually the configurations uh, of the cloud are optimized for workload classes. So I expect that's what will happen and you kind of extract and think of that. You have a blueprint which you build out of that saying, okay, for this class of the workload, this is how the cloud would look like. And obviously it's shareable across uh, multiple organizations. So somebody want to take that and you know adopt it for their use cases makes perfect sense. Uh, I think the, the more uh, where I'm less clear is how to federate those uh, you know, what exactly will be federated, what information, what sharing will be done, uh, kind of identity management which will be required for that, especially cross institutions who have no common identity management uh, is a little bit questionable for me. And the one which to me, you know, uh, is more interesting is uh, uh, extracting the data uh, to kind of understand what data need to be collected is you need to reconfigure those clouds uh, for specific uh, use cases, so we can clearly understand when you're doing this, you know, uh, you know, building the cloud continuously many different ways, uh, you know, what data you need to collect. We, we have I, some data, but I don't think we are ever targeted those kind of use cases. I, I think there's one thing that we that might be a case, and that is if you understand what you have and the configuration and the differences, and you're able to measure that then, and you're able to understand the measure, measurable dis difference between the different configurations, and you're at least able to extrapolate and not necessarily have to force a full reconfiguration of everything. And I, I suspect that might be some of what they're doing, at least on a research level. Yes, I think that's part of it. I think that I'd rather, I think we probably want to air somewhat in terms of having a number of prescriptive solutions that are reusable, um, because um, you know the more that we we allow full full sort of opening is is really problematic. I think we're starting with academia for a number of reasons. First of all, because we're here. Secondly, because it's a lot easier to get uh, telemetry information out from the cloud. It's a lot easier to get people to agree to exposing the telemetry information from the mass open cloud than it is from say the cloud internal to State Street um, and, and to make that available to the open source community. I think that it's also the fact that um, in our environment, um, identity is a solved problem um, because of a variety of efforts that have gone on between academic institutions. So that there's, there's certain things that are easier to solve in this environment. So we can get off the ground with federation that's not uniquely necessary, but to, to adopt what academia has done. But um, generally I can go to any university in uh, the United States and get on EduRoam and, uh, and be on wireless. And so those, those capabilities allow us to get off the ground um, a lot faster. 
Um, I think that in federation, there's a, I think that the first thing is to develop these cloud box solutions, fully automated or as automated as we can and building the community of SREs across universities that are supporting that, which we're the sort of in first stages of, but the more this open source community is involved in helping us automate those, helping select a set of offerings that might be prescriptive even down to the hardware in the first releases um, and replicatable to reduce the barriers to deployment, the better. Having said that, the other part that you guys both mentioned, we do need to carve out solutions for particular domains that are themselves elastic. Like we have, for example, Boston Children's Hospital wants to use this for a whole bunch of use cases. They have a set of streaming compute demands and they need HIPAA compliance for some of this stuff. And so we wanna create a repeatable environment that uses exactly the same models as the other parts, but that actually has a much higher compliance regime that kind of poofs appears when needed or may grow and shrink, um, but is a small part of that larger cloud even within a region for these compliance requirements. Sorry, I kind of went on for a while trying to address the comments you both made, was that? So I guess uh, for, for me, it feels like the next question is how can we help I, I, I'm going to let Michael lead that. So, so many ways. <laughs> so uh, let's keep the list simple and short, please. No, I know, I know, I know. Um, so one, one thing that I thought about as, as you and, and Arkady were talking about um, the gathering the info from the cloud, we have a, we're in the middle of trying to set up a working group that is focused specifically on telemetry. Um, and so that's, very likely an area that that and and one of the folks involved in it is from academia and one of the folks involved from it is from industry. Um, I think some of you may know um, uh, Marcel Hild from who, who's at Red Hat. He agreed to participate on the condition that it be a, an active working group with goals, not a talking group. And so um, that uh, we're going to try and. Uh, uh, reach out to folks to participate in. If, if folks who are on this call have a specific interest in, in that area, if you can drop your name into the etherpad, that would be a huge help because we'll make sure that we include you uh, in the initial kickoff meeting. Um, the other thing is for those, and I haven't looked at who's on, on the call, for those of you who, who are affiliated, who may be affiliated with hardware companies, um, we're running on fairly old hardware. And we believe that there is going to be a fairly huge demand. If once we move all of our current academic workloads or many of our current academic workloads over to the NERC and we start to have a lot more capacity at the MOC to handle CI CD for open source projects, I'm aware of the fact that we're going to start running into hardware uh, issues, both because of the age of some of our hardware. Some of it, it just isn't supported by some of the latest versions. Uh, and also because um, we expect there's gonna be greater demand than there is capacity. If we're successful, there will be greater demand than capacity. So for folks who are, who are involved with hardware companies, that's always an area that we're happy to get help on. Um, other areas are, um, we really would, we know that there are a lot of operators out there who have their own internal solutions to a lot of the problems that we're facing. So for example, how do we get to a common monitoring solution um, that is used across multiple projects and products? Um, I know of groups that are focusing on that, but I'd like to go more broadly within the community of operators. If, if there are people who, who you guys know, who you can connect us with, who we can get involved. Um, so far, the discussions about that have been more of a talking shop than a working and doing shop, and we want that to change. So uh, it's interesting you mentioned this because um, at least in the bare metal community, for the bare metal SIG, uh, we've we kind of talked about the same, uh, similar things uh, and trying how to move 
move from talking to actually doing or producing something. Yeah. And um, we think we have a plan. And it, interestingly enough, someone brought up the point that, well, it's kind of sounds like the uh, operator group that's part of OpenStack community is kind of trying to nibble on the same idea. How do we approach this problem? How do we spread this knowledge? And how do we, you know, possibly provide the part of that feedback loop? So I think it, this is a really good opportunity uh, to try and get to circle us all together and go, hey, we may necessarily not have the same solution, but if we have the same basic goals, maybe we can kind of cooperate, work together, mm -hmm. cross advertise for whatever it ends up being. Yeah. Uh, and go from that there. Would, that would be great. We haven't really done enough outreach to that operator group. Um, I only learned about it, I think, from you um, about a month back. Um, um, but, in, but in some sense, one of the things about this project is that it's the operators that are sort of in the driver's seat. Like we want yeah. this to be the place. So, you know, Scott, you know, we have we have the MOC and it's got a lot of users, but we expect NERC to rapidly, you know, th these are the production IT groups with facilitators that work with researchers. We expect this to kind of explode the usage and mm -hmm. um, as it goes past this proof of concept. And we sort of put Scott and Wayne and, and Michael in some sense of the driver's seat of playing what we're going to accept. So we're trying to create this cross, um, th this, this organization, which will directly, not as a general thing, not just as an operator community, but as a, as a we'd like to eventually have this go all the way to, you know, we really know strongly in the open source community and in fact, in the research community, what the usage of this environment is. So what do you want, maybe turning this on its head, because we want the open source community to really want to push this forward. What are you lacking in terms of visibility into how, at least in one environment, and it may not be representative of everything, but it is real. What telemetry do you want? What, what would be important for your project to allow it to evolve? So, you know, uh, to... Yeah, that, that, that's, at least from my perspective, and if there's anyone else, uh, that wants to answer this question by all means interject, but I, I feel like it's it's a mixture of use cases, it's a mixture of problems, it's a mixture of as you said telemetry data, um, it's a mixture of the logging actually that we can view with the telemetry data, try and correlate a problem, and investigate something back and. I can tell you from experience, the hardest thing to do is a try and get people to provide all that logging when there's an issue, and b be able to reproduce it. Uh, so when we have all this information being collected, captured, even continuously, even if it's only like a two week span uh, of this high resolution data, then at least it's easier to dig in and understand. And as long as it's easy to get at that data. So we're we're in a great position to give you that in the sense that we can stand up a new, it, it might not be the whole thing. Um, there's certainly some privacy issues to be concerned about. I guess we, we have already started, and this kind of came out of the Chameleon Project, adopting some of their stuff to anonymize, but I have, I have limited belief in how well the anonymization, I think we should also, we're talking about setting up a cluster, which is, which people can only use if they sign off in the first place that all information is totally available to a community. And it may not be to, you know, we'll have, the, the question is what restrictions do we put on the people who have access to it? But we'd like to make it really, really modest, right? We'd like the open source community, maybe, maybe, maybe there's sort of some requirement that each group in the open source, in, in you know, this community sort of uh, vets a person um, and that person signs something to say that uh, they're not going to use it for nefarious purposes. Um, but it should we should try to give the minimum barrier so that you have full access to all the telemetry and logs. And part of what we think was going to help a lot with that is that the HPC systems already do a lot of that. Um, and so there's there's a history of that already. And the universities already have the concept of data sharing relationships that they really clearly understand pretty deeply. 
Um, so we, we're, we're pretty hopeful that it's going to be a, 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 a fairly straightforward process. Yeah, it, I guess kind of going back to beyond or before the day that it's also kind of it's almost like those wants, needs, and dreams. Uh, and someone needs to write those down. Yeah. And when it's not a developer doing it, um, that's intimately involved in a project, it has a little more weight. And when it's someone that brings a compelling, hard problem, sometimes people actually pick up and run with it. We actually uh, were in the current outreach cycle and someone, one of the applicants, they're not getting paid. They're still in the applying phase, uh, enjoyed the tooling. They actually noticed, they like clicked the back button, noticed a, one of the items we had in our backlog as like a, a fairly easy task. And we're like, I'm gonna take this on. And then they actually really enjoyed it apparently. <laughs> and the point where they have talked about it, uh, but it's just, those are the kinds of things that we kind of need to track and understand and right. view. And, revisit and I, I guess kind of the habit of also just logging them in a bug tracker or whatever also doesn't really help because mm -hmm. it, it loses that identity it loses that emotion behind it and loses a lot of the uh, appeal of the problem why is the thing hard why is this not already been solved or is this a really simple problem if you turn that if you if you take the water bottle and do this does the problem become easier kind of thing. And that's, sometimes it just takes a different perspective. And so how do we do that? How do we get our problems, you know, in to this community, like so, really, really visible? So to make things really visible in this community, um, that's a good question. I mean, because what, what you have is you have, each project has its kind of own entry path. And when I say each project, it's probably better to say each project of each sub project or each sub project of each project. Because if you look at Ironic, for example, you have one process one way. Uh, and that's kind of where people build consensus. Uh, with Nova, you have another process in a, a somewhat different way. With another library, it might be just put the patch up. So I think kind of what the thing is, is you kind of build, I keep using this word and it's kind of what this event is, a forum uh, on a regular basis where you're kind of exchanging these thoughts, ideas and uh, re reaching the same page. And for example, we had uh, so much CERN, uh, they have a rant. They like to, to kind of go on every year <laughs> or every six months and they start going on the rant today. And someone's like, well, I, I'm almost there. I just haven't gotten to it yet. <laughs> so we, we need to get them to work together and kind of take that next logical step. So there has to be catalysts. There has to be some way to track it and some way to bring this stuff together. The best way I think is probably collect people together and give them a reason to somehow yeah. talk. Cross cross project, uh, uh, you know, maybe at PT at PTG meeting, uh, and I, then let the TC try to figure out how the best way to coordinate the cross project. I, I wouldn't even think that because I think that it's putting more work on their plate and more weight. I think it needs to be informal. I think it needs to be roughly structured, and I think it needs to also be kind of fun. So I I think Julia, that sorry, here's I, wanna, the, I want to back up oh, one second, Julia. Did you say it needs to be formal or informal? somewhat informal, but also have structure. Thanks. And, so and I, fun. I think that partly, you know, we sort of had this early conversation, I don't know, two years ago now or something, or a year ago about how we were, um, we were doing a lot of the stuff that the ironic was doing with this, our research, a bunch of code written by a bunch of graduate students, and it was being used in semi-production basis. And uh, then, you guys from the ironic team said, oh, well, no, we want to actually integrate this. And it's been sort of a one year effort, but now we're rolling out and replacing all of the Hill BMI stuff with ironic and doing our first experiments with that. Um, and assuming this is as successful as we hope it is, we then want to have ironic on top of ironic and the HPC clusters on top of this. And you're going to see a 200,000 cores of compute shifting over to using this if all goes as planned. 
Um, and that's like a massive experiment. I think that the same, we have the same kind of really close interaction with the Keystone group. My hope is just that we're showing these proof points of, you know, you kind of can visibly see something and then specifically ironic group, you can have full visibility into what we're doing because of that. So I'm hoping that it just becomes, I think that success is the way to do this is have particular communities that we're able to interact with and then we're rolling it out for real here. I, I, um, I, I think so. I also think that um, if there are questions, then maybe there, there should be answers. And what I mean by this is uh, the idea I kind of had in our ironic session for the Vermeil SIG was we have area, topic areas that there are subject, subject matter experts for uh, that are very complex that people try to avoid. And it's like, people don't have a good understanding of them because it's, it's kind of nebulous and doesn't, it's not clear. So we're thinking, our thought is, if we make little 10 minute videos and like do one a month and have it as part of this gathering. So people can ask a couple of questions and someone can do the five minute, here's how this works and here are the pieces, here are the layers. And maybe, maybe it's only two minutes. But you know, it, it kind of we generate something and we generate interaction and also have a recorded output. I, I like that. Uh, I think beyond the ironic one, I think you'll you'll probably need to uh, have deeper interaction with triple O guys, because ironic will set up your hardware, but um, you know, deploying the cloud itself and the configuration of the cloud with each of the components, right? That's really falls on the triple O. It it's not the only way of doing it, but uh, yeah. you know, in order to deploy the cloud, you know, multiple times proactively, basically you have the you know YAML templates, uh, which defines and you know we actually use it internally for our QE guys all the time. Yep, and I think Kendall just noted that we are out of time. But yes. it feels like we should continue having this discussion. So Definitely. how do we continue having this discussion? Do we just schedule a call or a meeting and, and start tweeting the link or something? So a couple of things. Um, I'll drop into the, um, I'll drop the, the various IRC and other channels into Open Infra Labs. We have a group of PTG slots next week that we have not necessarily associated with anything, but it feels like this is one that we ought to associate with one of those slots. Um, another quick thought that I had as we were speaking was one of the things, one of the ways that we could use help, maybe at a meta level, we're a very small team, figuring out how to incorporate help into that small team in a way that we can know what's going on. And so maybe I'll make that as a separate topic for one of the yeah, key I, I think it all comes down to just some, somehow we have to bring the people together. Yeah, I think that's exactly it. And so I, I, the, I, don't, sorry, I don't necessarily think that it's bring one person or a couple people into yet another community or another room. It's more yeah. bring them, everyone to the same neutral place, if that makes sense. Um, is email a good way to reach you right now, Julia? Or are you overwhelmed uh, by it this week? I am overwhelmed at the moment, but email is probably the best way. <laughs> Okay, the reason I asked that is I was going to ask you, I'm going to send a note to all the folks who added their name in the um, Etherpad talking about potential PTG meeting times, but it sounded like there were some other people that we might want to include in some of these discussions that you knew of, and so just getting their names either in the Etherpad or uh, in, uh, in an email would be great. Uh, the operators. John the Tuba guy specifically is probably the person to talk to, and also Arnie at uh, CERN. Arnie at I, CERN. I can't, I can't think uh, John's last name. I just know his IRC handle is John Garbage. the Tuba guy. Thank you. No problem. Kendo, can you drop those in? Since it sounds like you know the names, if you could drop those in somewhere yeah. in the notes, that would be a huge I'll put yeah. in the ether pad. I, I think what really is talking about uh, maybe kind of a joint session between the uh, bare metal SIG uh, and this working group. Yeah. Or, you know, well, not, I, not working group yet, but you know, 
I this group of it, people. I think one of the notes was in the chat was also probably also to see if the scientific working group has interest yeah. because it seems like we're all kind of talking about similar related things. Let's talk to about them together. Yes, yep. Stig, Stig generally attends the open infra lab meetings as well. So, mm -hmm. so um, we have at least that relationship. That relationship, okay. at least we we figured out. The rest we're gonna figure out. Okay. Well, thank you. All right. I appreciate so your time. Thanks. Bye. Bye.